Hello and welcome to our 15th COVID-19 webinar brought to you by New York Medical College and the Turo College and University System. I am, as always, your host. My name is Edward Halperin. I am the Chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs of the Turo College and University System. We have created the program for today's webinar based on your feedback from previous webinars, as well as some hot topics that have been in the news in the last two weeks. As I have said to you each time, you've got some of your old friends who you've come to know and love from previous webinars to speak with us today. And you're gonna make some new friends, people you haven't met before. We're gonna hear from Dr. Marissa Montecalvo, our board certified infectious disease specialist, who's gonna teach us all about this new drug, which we've read about in the newspapers and we've seen on television, alleged to be an antiviral drug. And she's gonna tell us what we know so far about it and its potential efficacy. We're going to hear from Professor Sandra Russo of the Turo School of Nursing, who's gonna talk with us about whether there really is a nursing crisis related to COVID-19. And if so, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, Dr. Tammy Hendricks is back with us, our member of the pediatrics faculty from the Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine. And she's gonna talk to us about the evolving story about vaccinations for children, what we need to know about this topic and how this will play out. Uh, you're going to hear from Dr. Uh, John Loike. You haven't met him before. Dr. Loike is a neuroscientist and a medical ethicist, and he's going to talk to us about the conflict in medical ethics between your right to personal liberty and your obligations to the group. If I don't want to wear a mask, should I be compelled to wear a mask because it's in the best interest of the group? It's an important ethical topic, and he's going to to give us an introduction to ethical thinking about this. Back again with us is Dr. Mel Etienne, a neurologist. He's gonna talk with us about what some people are calling one of the effects of so-called long COVID, the issue of brain fog. What is it and how is it treated? And uh, I'm gonna be speaking with you at today's webinar about the evolving story about whether there is or is not a role for low dose lung irradiation to try to deal with the cytokine cascade of COVID-19 pneumonia. We've got a lot to cover and we're gonna hear from each of our speakers and there'll be a question and answer period afterwards. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box on the screen. For most of you, it'll be on the bottom of your screen. Some of it will be on the top of the screen. We will monitor these questions as we go along. And, and when we get to the Q&A period, Dr. Alan Kadish, the president of the Turo College University System, will be our moderator. And he'll hand out the questions to our panelists, and we'll try to cover as many as we can in the time we have. For those of you who are interested in getting continuing medical education, CME credit. I will appear uh, twice during the speeches and uh, tell you how to get your CME credit either by texting or going online to do so. And there'll also be a word of how, how you might make a philanthropic contribution to support this webinar and our COVID-19 research. Thanks for joining us. We hope you find this program interesting and profitable, and let's get started with the first of our speakers. Hello, I'm Dr. Mel Etienne, Associate Professor of Neurology and Medicine here at New York Medical College. We are now more than 18 months since the COVID-19 pandemic made its way to the US shores, and we are now taking a closer look at the long-term sequelae of this condition. I will spend the next few minutes discussing the post-acute COVID-19 syndrome with a specific focus on brain fog which many patients who have had COVID are now experiencing. I have no conflicts of interest. We are putting together the pieces of the many ways that COVID infection can impact the brain. Post-acute COVID syndrome has many names. 
In addition to being known as post-acute COVID syndrome, it is also known as long COVID syndrome, chronic COVID syndrome, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, and many of the patients refer to themselves as the long haulers. Post-acute COVID syndrome is a multi-system disease that lasts four or more weeks following initial symptoms of COVID-19 infections. The signs and symptoms continue to develop after acute COVID-19 infection. This includes ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 infection lasting four to 12 weeks, and also includes a post-COVID syndrome with signs and symptoms that persist beyond 12 weeks. Although it is most commonly seen in patients who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 infection, anyone who has had COVID can get these symptoms. Long COVID syndrome is a serious concern. The symptoms of long COVID syndrome are similar to those of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, mast cell activation syndrome, systemic mastocytosis, and it is also similar to the brain fog experienced by patients who have been treated with chemotherapy, often referred to as chemo brain. The most vexing symptoms are chronic physical and mental fatigue, also known as brain fog. The mechanism underlying these symptoms is unknown. It is important to note that stress-related neuropeptides and interferons could induce ACE2 expression on mast cells and microglia, and that stimulation of hypothalamic mast cells and microglia by SARS-CoV-2 could lead to the release of pro-inflammatory mediators. This table shows common neurological and other symptoms of the long haul syndrome, including many types of cognitive problems, headaches, myalgias, shortness of breath, among many other symptoms. This is a depiction of the relative frequency of the various symptoms of the long haul syndrome. The darker and larger the circle, the more frequently we are seeing that symptom in patients suffering from the long haul syndrome. As you can see here, some of the more common symptoms are fatigue, body aches, inability to exercise, headache, and difficulty sleeping. Some of these problems may, may be due to permanent damage to the lungs, heart, kidneys, or other organs. We will be focusing on the brain fog. People who are experiencing brain fog describe their thinking as sluggish, fuzzy, and not sharp. They have difficulty concentrating and difficulty with multitasking. As you hear me describe this, you may be thinking, I have never had COVID, but I have had these symptoms. This is likely true. Brain fog is something that most of us have likely experienced uh, when we've, whether you've had a treatment with antihistamines, had a head cold, stayed up all night, and then had to function the following day, or just did not get a good night's sleep for whatever reason. People who go from working the night shift to the day shift and vice versa, and those who are experiencing jet lag, are likely to have experienced brain fog. These are just a few examples of scenarios that may have led you to experience brain fog. However, the big difference with patients who are experiencing the COVID long haul syndrome with brain fog is that they are experiencing these symptoms every day. The term fog is used because the patients feel that there is something over them that is making things not as crisp or distinct as they were before. Anyone who has taken an antihistamine or other sedating medication likely has a good sense of what it feels like to go from having that fog feeling to seeing clearly or having that fog lifted. Again, the big difference with the long haul syndrome is that these patients feel like the fog is just not going away or it's just not being lifted. Here's a list of the common symptoms of brain fog. These symptoms may make it worse, make it more difficult for you to function at work and at home. You might find it difficult to manage your finances and find that it is taking you longer to complete numerous tasks. It is not clear what causes brain fog, but it may involve neuroinflammation via mast cells stimulated by pathogenic and stress stimuli to release mediators that activate microglia and lead to the inflammation of the hypothalamus. All the proposed mechanisms include the lack of oxygen caused by lung damage, an autoimmune disorder that is causing the immune system to attack healthy cells in the body, lack of blood flow caused by swelling of the small blood vessels in the brain, and invasion of infectious cells into the brain. If you are experiencing long-haul syndrome, you may be wondering, 
how long do I have to live with this? Some patients have seen symptoms resolve after three months. Some are still experiencing symptoms a year after the acute phase of COVID, but overall improved when they first had this syndrome. And others are experiencing a waxing and waning course. This time course can be variable, and I have demonstrated two sample courses of improvement to the right, but there are many others. What to do about brain fog? Physical activity. You may need to start slow, perhaps just do two to three minutes of aerobic activity a day and gradually build up until you can do up to 30 minutes a day, three to five times per week. For example, increasing physical activity can have beneficial effects such as oxygenating and clearing toxins from the body. However, after COVID-19, some patients can experience a condition called post-exertional malaise, which results in a huge drop in energy levels after activity. Diet. Mediterranean and other diets that are anti-inflammatory can be very helpful in improving the brain fog. Lifestyle, you wanna avoid alcohol and drugs because these can slow down the healing process. Get a good night's sleep if possible. Sleep allows your brain and body to clear toxins and work towards healing. Engage in enjoying activities, including novel activities like listening to music, practicing mindfulness and journaling. Here are some tips to engage in while you're waiting for the recovery. Uh, use a calendar for uh, note-taking or a to-do list to assist with memory. Word associations to help with finding the right words. Minimize distractions to improve attention. Build up your cognitive endurance to reduce cognitive fatigue and improve concentration. I have here a picture of a memory bowl. Um, items that you commonly lose, you can just say, I'm gonna put it in my memory bowl. Things like your keys, cell phone, Credit cards, wallets can be placed in there. That way you know exactly where they are. But rest assured, you should be getting better over time. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello again, this is your host, Dr. Edward Halperin with information for those of you who wish to get continuing medical education credit, CME credit for today's program. In order to get CME credit, as we always do, we have three ways you can do it. You can text the code 62RUSK, R-U-S-K, all in capital letters, 62RUSK. Text that to the phone number 828-295-1144. If you do that, you'll get a response back and it'll walk you through how to get your credit and how to fill out your satisfaction questionnaire. Or if you'd rather, you can go to the website, www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, enter that same code, and it'll walk you through the process for the questionnaire and your CME credit. Or you can whip out your cell phone, scan the QR code, and it will walk you through the process also. Whichever way you do it, I recommend you go ahead and do it because the code will expire at one o'clock on Monday, October 18. So if you'd like to get your hour and a half of CME credit, please either take a screenshot or write these numbers down or do something to remind yourself to get about your business and get the credit before the website and the sign-in expires. Now let's go back to our program. Hi, my name is Dr. Tammy Hendricks and I'm the Dean and Chief Academic Officer of Torrey University, California, College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'll be talking to you today about COVID-19 vaccines for children and what you need to know. I have no disclosures for this talk. First, let's talk about the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for ages 12 and up. What do we know about it? We know that hundreds of millions of people have been safely vaccinated with this vaccine. It consists of two 30 microgram doses that are given three weeks apart. Initially, this vaccine was given emergency use authorization by the FDA in December of 2020 for individuals aged 16 years and up. That emergency use authorization was extended to ages 12 and up in May of this year. And it was given full FDA approval in August of this year 
for ages 12 and up. What do we know about children and COVID-19? We know that kids can develop mild and asymptomatic infections from COVID-19. We also know that you don't need to have symptoms to spread the virus. So we know that even those kids with mild and asymptomatic infections can and do still spread the virus across their communities. We also know that children can develop severe acute COVID-19, causing pneumonia, causing them to be hospitalized, causing them to be intubated. We know that kids can also develop multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC. This is a syndrome that happens after a COVID-19 infection. It could be an asymptomatic or mild COVID-19 infection. And then multiple organs of the child are inflamed. This can be an absolutely devastating disease uh, that can have long-term impacts and be deadly. We also know that kids can develop long COVID. So long COVID are those long-term effects that you have after a COVID-19 infection. And once again, that COVID-19 infection, the initial one could be mild or asymptomatic, and then it could have long-term uh, impacts on the heart and the lungs. In the United States, we've had thousands of pediatric COVID-19 cases. Greater than 4,500 children have been hospitalized due to COVID-19. We've had more than 640 pediatric deaths from COVID-19. Children under 18 make up about 22% of the US population, but account for 27% of all cases of COVID-19 nationwide. Here, we're looking at a chart that shows us the incidence, the number of cases of COVID-19 in individuals aged zero to 17 years. We can see there has been a dramatic uptick since Delta came to our country. So over the last couple of months, we've seen this dramatic rate of rise. This is looking at similar data, but instead of just the number of cases, we're looking at the number of children who have been hospitalized with COVID-19. And once again, we see that dramatic rise that has occurred since June and July of this year. We've seen increasing COVID-19 hospitalization among US children and adolescents since the rise of the Delta variant a tenfold increase in hospitalizations among kids aged zero to four years. We also know that hospitalizations among unvaccinated teens are 10 times higher than those that are fully vaccinated. So vaccines are working and protecting. We're really focused right now on the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for ages five to 11. Pfizer's clinical trials have enrolled greater than 4,500 children and spread them across three different age groups, five to 11 years, two to five years, and six months to two years. These have occurred across 90 different sites across the United States, Finland, Poland, and Spain. For the five to 11 year age group, they've determined that two 10 microgram doses given three weeks apart are the preferred dose for safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity. In July of 2021, the FDA requested more children in the trial so they could better look at the safety and efficacy of all the vaccines. Pfizer submitted their trial data for ages five to 11 on September 20th, 2021. That data has shown a comparable immune response and side effect profile to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for ages 12 and up, even though it's at one third of a dose. We know that children are not just small adults. Uh, they have, they're different anatomically and physiologically. And so a different dose is more appropriate for the different age groups. Out of this trial data, 18 children had COVID-19, developed COVID-19. All 18 of those children were in the placebo group. No children in the vaccine group developed COVID-19. One of the big questions that people have had, one of the reasons that the FDA requested more data is do the vaccines cause heart inflammation? A couple quick definitions here. Myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle itself. Pericarditis is inflammation of the outer lining of the heart. What we've seen is that male teens and male young adults are the ones that tend to be impacted with this, typically within days of the second dose of the vaccine. 
And almost all of these cases have been mild with a very quick recovery, not requiring hospitalization or long-term treatment. We also know from very recent studies that have been published that these incidents are rare. So about two per 100,000 cases. When we compare that to the risk of COVID-19 complications in somebody who gets COVID-19, the risk of complications is significantly higher with COVID-19. 30 to 40% of the cases develop complications. So as you're weighing those risk benefit ratios, the benefits from the vaccines far outweigh the risks. The FDA is gonna hold advisory committee meetings to discuss the emergency use authorization for this Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for ages five to 11 years. It's gonna be live streamed on October 26th with anticipated approval of the vaccine sometime between Halloween and Thanksgiving. We have the ongoing pediatric COVID-19 vaccine trials. It includes the two younger age groups for Pfizer. So two to five years, they're gonna be using a three microgram dose for that compared to the 10 microgram dose for ages five to 11 and the 30 microgram dose for ages 12 and up. Uh, they also have an ongoing trial for ages six months to two years. Similarly, Moderna, who has enrolled 13,000 children for their clinical trials, um, they're also looking at different doses across the age ranges from six months to 11 years. And Johnson & Johnson also has their ongoing trial for ages 12 to 17 years. Hopefully soon, we'll be able to protect everybody in our population from this virus. Thank you so very much. Hello again, this is Dr. Edward Halperin, the Chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs of the Turo College and University System, to chat with you about an interesting area of potential therapeutics for COVID-19, the use of low-dose radiation therapy for the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia. I have no conflicts of interest to declare in respect to today's remarks. Radiation therapy is also called radiotherapy. It is a form of medical therapy utilizing ionizing radiation. It is used in the treatment of about 60% of patients with cancer for the purpose of killing malignant cells. It can be delivered with a linear accelerator, a particle accelerator, or a radioactive implant. The discovery of x-rays is attributed to Wilhelm Conrad Rentgen, in November 1895. Rentgen was a physics professor at the University of Würzburg in Germany. And shortly after his discovery, he began making what were called CEographs, Rentgenographs, radiographs, or X-rays, including this famous one of Frau Rentgen, his wife, showing her left hand and her wedding band. Radiation therapy for the treatment of cancer was being employed as soon, we think, as January 1896, within two months of the discovery of the X-ray. Radiation therapy produces discrete ionizations. You can see these ionizations in a cloud chamber photograph. These depositions of energy or quanta of energy are a physical effect, which produces a biological effect. Ionizing radiation kills cells by producing non-reparable double-stranded DNA breaks, along with the induction of programmed cell death, also called apoptosis. When ionizing radiation interacts with molecules such as water, electrons are knocked away from the atom and produce peroxy-free radicals, OH molecules, with a electron in their outer shell unbalanced by another electron. These are highly reactive. They can either directly interact with DNA through the so-called direct action or indirectly as mediated by water. Either way, when these free radicals interact with the double helix, they can produce double-stranded DNA breaks, the inability of the cell to reproduce and clonogenic death or apoptosis, death either from inability to reproduce or from programmed cell death. You can measure the killing power of ionizing radiation 
via the clonogenic assay and display it on a radiation cell survival curve. On the y-axis, you measure the probability of survival of the cell after being exposed to radiation. On the x-axis, the dose of radiation. These cell survival curves typically have a shoulder showing that cells can, to some extent, repair radiation damage when the dose is low. And then the curve becomes steep, showing that at higher doses of radiation, it is easier to kill cells at these higher doses. It is interesting to note that there is, in general, an absence of a shoulder on the cell survival curve, showing an inability to repair radiation injury in lymphocytes. This demonstrates that lymphocytes are very radiosensitive. Here, for example, is a cell survival curve of a patient identified as patient B540, showing her cell survival for lymphocytes with dose of radiation on the x axis and probability of survival on the y. And you see no shoulder. Radiation is very uh, capable of killing lymphocytes very easily as well as other cells related to the immune response, such as macrophages and monocytes. In the early history of radiation therapy, radiation was also used as a general anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive agent because of its ability to kill lymphocytes and related cells of the immune system. Examples of radiotherapy used for the treatment of benign inflammatory disease was as an immunosuppressive for organ transplantation of hearts or kidneys or livers or bone marrow transplantation for, for benign disease such as sickle cell anemia. Radiation for the treatment of mastitis or arthritis or the pain from inflammation of shingles or prior to the discovery of antibiotics up until the 1940s and 50s, sometimes for the treatment of pneumonia. But these uses of radiation therapy have almost completely fallen out of favor in the United States, except for the use of total lymphoid irradiation for bone marrow transplantation for sickle cell anemia or thoracoabdominal irradiation for Fanconi's anemia. But these types of radiation are still often used in other countries for inflammatory situations. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, some physician investigators raised the issue of whether or not radiation therapy could be used for low dose lung irradiation to disrupt the host immune cascade or so-called cytokine storm, which leads to potentially fatal COVID-19 pneumonia. Similar to the use of steroids or other drug treatments, could radiation interrupt the cytokine storm and present the severe consequences of COVID-19 pneumonia. This may strike you as curious. You may say, wait a minute, can't radiation therapy damage normal tissue? Can it cause cancer years and decades later? If you give a single dose of radiation to the lungs on Monday and kill the inflammatory cells, won't the body just send more cells in to replace them on Tuesday? And isn't it possible that exposing the COVID-19 virus to radiation Will make it mutate into more virulent forms? The answer to all four questions is yes, those are all real concerns. And that is weighing the ethical dilemma of this form of therapy. Would it be beneficial enough to outweigh these potential risks? Is the potential situation so dire as to merit an attempt to disrupt the immune cascade and cytokine storm? with a single dose of whole lung radiation, or as I was taught by one of my attending physicians when I was a resident, Dr. C.C. C. Wong, with his charming accent, in clinical medicine, not kill fly with cannon, kill fly with fly swatter. Is radiation overkill for pneumonitis from COVID-19? Here's the data. A meticulous review of the US government clinical registry and the World Health Organization registry allowed me to identify 19 either completed or ongoing studies in this regard. 
Of the studies which have some data, there are studies with small numbers of patients shown here from these institutions or organizations shown here with a range of patients shown here who were allowed into the study either because they were oxygen dependent or on a ventilator or because of the national early warning system score system for COVID-19 at a high score indicating bad disease. They received between 50 and 150 centigrade to the lungs and results have been reported for a few of these studies. These studies, which might be considered for the most part as glorified case reports, show an alleged positive benefit to low dose whole lung irradiation in the reports from Emory University in Atlanta, from the All India Medical Institute, and two small studies from Spain. A report from Tehran in Iran claims to be a study showing a benefit, but carefully looking at the data makes one speculate that they probably did not help the patients. And the most detailed study from University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland, a head-to-head -head randomization of radiation to sham irradiation showed no difference in survival or days on the ventilator. Critics of the Swiss study say, well, they waited till the patients were on the ventilator. They should have intervened earlier when the patients were on oxygen, but not on the ventilator. There are also 10 studies, for the most part, much larger, currently underway, for the most part in India, but also in Italy and in the United States, testing patients either who have rapid respiratory rates or are on oxygen or have low saturation, assessing low dose whole lung irradiation. We await the results of this data with interest. In conclusion, this type of radiation is whole lung irradiation as shown here, which would envelop the lungs and the heart and part of the liver and part of the kidneys with anterior and posterior fields. The single randomized prospective trial from Switzerland, as you see in the upper left, use meticulous care of technologists in protective gear, localizing the beam with laser beams to give whole lung irradiation. But in the survival curves on the right, there was no difference. And in the bar graph on the bottom, where red and brown show being on the ventilator and green off the ventilator, and X death, there was no difference between sham irradiation and real irradiation. We can conclude that I have explained the rationale for the large number of ongoing clinical trials in multiple countries for low-dose lung irradiation, COVID-19 pneumonia, that the doses of radiation used in these trials, 50 to 100 centigrade, or a fraction of the doses typically used in curative radiotherapy for cancer, 3,500 to 7,800 centigrade, but there's still a significant risk of second malignant neoplasms and other normal tissue injury. The current state of clinical data is insufficient to draw any conclusions regarding the use of this treatment in ill but not ventilator-dependent patients. The single small randomized trial for ventilator-dependent patients is negative. Advocates for this form of therapy assert that like the use of steroids, you have to intervene early with immunosuppressive irradiation to make the difference, but we're going to see if that's true or not as more data becomes available. If you'd like to take a screenshot of some of the references in this regard, here is a list, but I caution you that many of the references are actually only speculative or hypotheses. There are a limited number of references with real data, and I have just shown you the real data in my two slides. Thanks for your attention today. Good afternoon. I'm Marissa Montecalvo, and I'm speaking on malnupiravir, which is an oral potential treatment for COVID-19. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. When we look at treatments for COVID-19, they're organized based upon the severity of illness of the patients. So these are two parts of the National Institutes of Health Treatment Guidelines. In blue, 
are patients not requiring hospitalization or supplemental oxygen. And for those patients, if they are at risk of the development of severe SARS-CoV-2, monoclonal antibodies are recommended. For patients with more severe disease shown in the lower panel, that is those requiring hospitalization or supplemental oxygen, remdesivir or remdesivir in combination with dexamethasone is, re is recommended. So going back to the patient who doesn't require hospitalization but is at high risk for the development of severe disease, the monoclonal antibodies have been shown to reduce hospitalization. The issue is these must be given intravenously. If we look at the treatment targets for this infection, the monoclonal antibodies work right at the point of fusion and prevent the virus from entering the cell. Remdesivir interferes with viral replication and molnupiravir is in the same place as remdesivir, interfering with viral replication, whereas steroids work by their anti-inflammatory action. So how does molnupiravir do this? Well, molnupiravir mimics cytosine, which as you remember is one of the essential nucleic acids, uh, part of our DNA backbone. So when SARS-CoV-2 goes to replicate, it needs cytosine, but instead it incorporates molnupiravir. And this results in viral replication errors so that SARS-CoV-2 cannot make a viable virus. So what are the clinical data behind this? Well, in the Great Science Journal, the New York Times published on October 1st that Merck had the first antiviral pill to be effective against COVID-19. And this was, uh, these were the results of the move out study, which was stopped in an interim analysis because of the results. So the move out study is a double blind placebo controlled trial looking at various doses of molnupiravir versus placebo, 200, 400, and 800 milligrams. The treatment is given twice daily for five consecutive days. The trial was recruited globally. To be eligible for participation, one had to be unvaccinated so that you'd be at risk for the development of severe disease. Symptomatic, with at least one risk factor for the development of severe disease and excluded were persons who were so sick that it was thought that they would be hospitalized within 48 hours. The end point of the trial was either hospitalization or death within 29 days. And here are the results. These results are with approximately 50% of the trial enrolled and you can see that the rate of hospitalization, the percentage of hospitalization or death was half in those receiving molnupiravir compared with placebo. The actual number of deaths were zero in the molnupiravir treated patients versus eight deaths in the placebo treated patients. For those isolates that could be sequenced, the Delta, Gamma, and Mu variants did account for approximately 80% of the cases of those enrolled in, this, in the study. There are other studies also ongoing. In a preprint, uh, there is a study on the time to viral clearance using molnupiravir versus placebo where patients uh, had PCR done at days 1, 3, 5, 7, 14, and 28 during the uh, beginning with the five-day treatment and then were tested sequentially. And it was shown that there was a significant decrease in the detection of virus at day three for those persons on 800 milligrams compared with placebo. And lastly, there is also a move ahead study that is going to look at molnupiravir for post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for persons who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and at risk for the development of severe disease, similar to the way the monoclonal antibodies are currently being used for post-exposure prophylaxis. So in summary, molnupiravir is a very promising oral antiviral agent 
uh, that will interfere with SARS-CoV-2 replication. The phase three data in outpatients with mild to moderate disease who are at risk for severe infection showed a significant decrease in hospitalization and death. And so it looks like molnupiravir may provide an important, easy to use alternative to prevent hospitalization. And this would be an alternative to the use of monoclonal antibodies. However, treatment does need to be initiated soon after symptom onset, which means that it would be important for there to be rapid identification and access to treatment for infected persons. And as I mentioned previously, this is also being looked at as an agent for post-exposure prophylaxis. Thank you very much. Hello again, this is your host, Dr. Edward Halperin, with information for those of you who wish to get continuing medical education credit, CME credit, for today's program. In order to get CME credit, as we always do, we have three ways you can do it. You can text the code 62RUSK, R-U-S-K, all in capital letters, 62RUSK. Text that to the phone number 828-295-1144. If you do that, you'll get a response back and it'll walk you through how to get your credit and how to fill out your satisfaction questionnaire. Or if you'd rather, you can go to the website www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, enter that same code, and it'll walk you through the process for the questionnaire and your CME credit. Or you can whip out your cell phone, scan the QR code, and it will walk you through the process also. Whichever way you do it, I recommend you go ahead and do it because the code will expire at one o'clock on Monday, October 18. So if you'd like to get your hour and a half of CME credit, please either take a screenshot or write these numbers down or do something to remind yourself to get about your business and get the credit before the website and the sign-in expires. Now let's go back to our program. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Russo. I'm the chair and the director of nursing at Toro College. I will be speaking with you today about American nursing in crisis due to COVID-19, some of its causes, effects, and potential solutions. The slides that I'm going to show you, I will not be speaking to you in detail due to time constraints, but you may use them at a further date for reference. Of course, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose to you. Let's look at the profile of the nursing workforce. There are 44.2 million nurses in the United States, and the medium age of an RN is 52 years. As you can see, the workforce is getting close to retirement. Nurses are also leaving due to burnout and because of COVID-19. They are also, nurses are also considering changing careers due to COVID-19. Healthcare leaders have known for a while that we are facing a nursing shortage. A study done by Zhang in 2018 predicted a work shortage of half a million nurses by 2030. However, after COVID, the United States Bureau of Statistics predicts 11 million additional nurses are needed to avoid a further shortage. There are several reasons for this shortage. But the ANA says the main one is the retiring of baby boomer nurses and also an aging population in the United States. For the first time, the United States has the highest population of citizens over the age of 65. In September of this year, the American Nurses Association called for the Department of Health and Human Resource Services to declare a national nurse staffing crisis. 
you can see hospitals are overwhelmed with this staffing shortage due to COVID. ICUs cannot be at full capacity. A hospital in upstate New York had to close its maternity unit because they had no nurses to help with the delivery of babies. And here in Brooklyn, New York, one of our hospitals is down 70 nurses in their emergency room. And the nurses are struggling to provide adequate care. What are the nurses saying about this shortage during COVID? These are quotes from a qualitative study presently being done in the University of Arizona. The nurses are tired and the overall theme of the research is that they're angry and overburdened. They're angry because too many nurses, too many, uh, too many people did not get vaccinated. And they're also angry because people are not wearing their mask. So nurses are there to help patients. If they wear their mask or they don't wear their mask, they say they're gonna care for you but they're, they're feeling this heavy weight of anger. We in nursing education have also felt this staffing crisis. Adjunct faculty that provide clinical supervision in our hospitals could not work for nursing education because they had to work for their primary employer due to staffing. Also, nursing faculty now are being lured into clinical and private areas for the higher pay. We also have a very small pool of potential applicants. Nursing education during COVID. In spring of 2020, like other healthcare disciplines, all of our clinical rotations were closed. In fall of 2021, nursing students were able to return to full hospital experiences. However, hospitals decreased the cohort size that we were allowed to bring in the hospital from 12 to four to six students. This causes a huge um, budget to cover. We are expending twice the amount of money to cover our clinical areas. They also mandated COVID vaccine and flu vaccines for all of our students. Pandemic education at Toro. We used virtual classrooms, virtual SIM. All of our faculty were 100% certified in online learning. Our faculty were innovative and flexible, and we collaborated using the use of assessment technologies. We saw an increase in online with we saw an increase with online education in student engagement and in our outcomes. Students liked online education. They liked to be able to review their lecture studies with their PowerPoints. They felt more engaged because there were more faculty meetings. There were more one-to-one -one meetings. And it was a positive experience for us. Some potential solutions. Nursing education may be shaped in new and exciting ways as solutions are developed to meet the current and future faculty shortage. The ANA has suggested some solutions that may attract and retain future nurses, some of them being better teamwork among healthcare leaders to engage nurses in high level decision making, increasing compensation, improving training opportunities for nurses who want to stay at the bedside, and improve the image of nursing, and therefore continue to attract people to the profession. Thank you for your time and my references. Thank you again. My name is Dr. John Loike. I'm professor of biology and interim director of bioethics and humanities at NYMC. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. The title of my talk is Wearing Masks, Balancing Personal Rights and Community Safety. 
Religious freedom and autonomy are core American values enshrined in our constitution. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we have tried to balance our efforts to eradicate or control this terrible virus while trying to protect American values. Here, I discuss the policy of mandating wearing masks in schools and in the workplace within a framework of protecting our community and our personal rights and freedoms. I will focus on three perspectives of this question, the legal, the medical, and the Jewish perspective. In late July, President Biden ordered federal employees and contractors to attest to their own vaccination status or to wear masks on the job and get frequent COVID-19 tests. The military also mandated mask wearing. The executive branch of our government is empowered to make rules to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into our own country and from one state into the other. Congress also has powers under spending clauses and commercial clause to influence state mask mandates by providing financial incentives. However, there are legal scholars that propose that federal constitution precedents make it unlikely that the federal government could issue a national mask wearing mandate that applies to states. State issue mask mandates may violate federal constitution's first amendments, free speech and assembly clauses, or the masks themselves may represent forced political expression. There are fundamentally differences between anti-smoking, seatbelt mandates and wearing masks. I will touch on just a few. Unlike seatbelts or refraining from smoking, wearing masks may have some health issues. Wearing a mask may make people feel insecure or even psychologically troubled. From a social perspective, wearing masks affects education and business networking. All of us in education recognize that teaching a class full of masked students is not as pedagogically effective as a traditional class setting. Similarly, business meetings, negotiations, or interviews are more challenging when the people are wearing masks. In summary, from a legal perspective, wearing masks may be more akin to vaccination mandates than wearing seatbelts or anti-smoking laws, and therefore may be subject to vaccine exemptions due to health issues or religious reasons. However, one must emphasize that health, education, and social issues related to wearing masks are pale in comparison to the devastating effects of contracting COVID, especially in unvaccinated populations. From a medical perspective, the story takes a slightly different tone because we need to look at actual data. Does wearing masks protect society from COVID? A recent PNS article from 2021 provides important answers to this question. Note that the authors of this article come from a wide variety of well-known institutions, including University of San Francisco, Stanford University, MIT, UCLA, Peking University, and the University of Oxford. In this article, they say that the primary route of transmission of COVID is airborne via respiratory particles. And it is known that viral airborne transmission occurs in pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, and asymptomatic individuals. So aside from vaccinations, reducing COVID requires limiting the contact of infected individuals by measures that reduce the transmission probability per contact. Thus, wearing masks reduces viral transmissibility per contact by reducing transmission of infected respiratory particles. In addition, the article shows that public mask wearing is shown to be most effective by reducing the spread of the virus when compliance is high. Mandating masks can promote and will promote high compliance. One must appreciate why the Delta variant has been shown to be more transmissible. First, because its viral load is much less than the original form of COVID. Moreover, recent studies show that this variant has a longer half-life in ambient air than the original COVID. Wearing masks will also reduce the Delta variant 
primarily because this virus is also very sensitive to human air, human air that is generated by the mask wearer and therefore decreases the viability of this virus in the mask wearer. Six months ago, most scientists believed that the FDA approval of COVID vaccines would rapidly promote vaccinations and achieve herd immunity. Unfortunately, the 60% rate of vaccinations in countries such as the United States is not even close to the current estimate that we need 90% of our population to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. We must appreciate that there are two major objectives in controlling this virus. The first is protecting the population from serious disease. The second is creating an environment where the virus cannot mutate. Thus, vaccinations, wearing masks, and even getting booster shots can achieve these essential outcomes. All the current vaccines protect the vaccinated from severe disease and hospitalization. Booster shots will also dramatically raise the serum antibody levels for an additional three to six months and will dramatically lower the number of viral particles that asymptomatic vaccinated people produce when infected with this virus. Finally, from a scientific perspective, it's the combination of vaccinations, wearing masks, and promoting booster shots that will lower the human environment where the virus can replicate and mutate and may be the best way to control this virus. From a Jewish perspective, Judaism believes in autonomy, but not in absolute autonomy. According to the late Rabbi Moses Tendler, one of the leading Jewish scholars of the past 75 years, and our own Professor Rabbi Flau, they state that a person must protect himself against any form of harm. However, a person is allowed to endanger himself or herself for a good cause. They can become firemen, firewomen, policemen, police women, careers that involve dangerous situations as they protect the community at large. However, Jewish law does not allow an individual to engage in an autonomous decision whose action endangers others, especially the community. If a person is healthy, he or she is obligated by Jewish law to get vaccinated to protect themselves and equally important to protect the community. Similarly, wearing masks and receiving booster shot will certainly protect others from the virus and can only be viewed as being mandated by Jewish law. The First Amendment does not guarantee a right to a religious exemption to vaccines. In fact, the First Amendment protects religious beliefs, but not necessarily actions that stem from those beliefs. Very seldom do religions actually oppose vaccinations. To my knowledge, there is no major rabbinical authority who would grant religious exemption to vaccinations. And I'm sure this applies to wearing masks as well. So the next time you're wondering about mandating mask wearing, I think the answer is yes. It is an effective addition to vaccinations and booster shots to control or even eradicate COVID-19. Thank you very much. Hello again, this is your host, Dr. Edward Halperin, with a word about how you can financially support programs like the one you're watching today and COVID-19 research at New York Medical College. Programs like this and research projects like the ones you've heard about today certainly require time, effort, and funds. While we provide your CME credit for free, it's certainly not free to generate classes like this one. And we hope that you will consider making a tax deductible gift to help offset our costs. Great things are happening in New York Medical College and we hope you'll want to be a part of it. There are three ways you can make a gift. If you'd like to pick up the phone and dial 914-594-2720, someone from the fundraising office will be happy to take the information and your credit card information. If you'd like to go online, you can go to www.nymc.edu slash give and make a donation that way. Or if you prefer getting out a pen in your checkbook, more than happy to take a check, please make the check out to New York Medical College and in the memo line, put support of COVID-19 programming, put it in an envelope and mail it to New York Medical College, Office of Development, 40 Sunshine Cottage Road, Valhalla, New York, 10595. We wanna thank you for thinking of us during these challenging times. We hope everyone's staying safe and healthy 
And we're now going to continue with our program with the question and answer portion of today's program moderated by the president of the Turo College and University System, Dr. Alan Kadish. Dr. Kadish, the podium is yours. Well, for those of you who are being quite observant, you'll notice that I'm not Alan Kadish. This is Dr. Edward Halperin. I'm sorry to report that Dr. Kadish isn't feeling uh, very well this afternoon. So I'm going to fill in as your moderator of the question and answer program. For those of you who have typed questions in for Dr. Mill Etienne, who spoke with us about brain fog, Dr. Etienne, in addition to being a neurologist and a member of the New York Medical College Administrator, is also an officer in the United States Navy Medical Corps. And he's been called up for active duty, so he will not be able to join us for a Q&A this afternoon. We have a large number of questions which have come in for us today. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Marissa Montecalvo for a few questions. Dr. Montecalvo, if you could uh, come on with your video and unmute. Uh, Dr. Montecalvo, uh, let's, let's start with a question which has been raised in previous webinars. The questioner wants to know, the way things are going, how are we ever going to decide if people are going to need a fourth Pfizer shot? Are we all going to end up being vaccinated or have to show up for boosters every six months or every year the way this is going? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Well, you know, we, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I, it is so important that we work from scientific data. Uh, when, when the FDA and the American College of Immunization Practices evaluate boosters, they look at laboratory data, neutralizing antibodies, as well as the function of memory cells. And they look at clinical experience, efficacy against death, hospitalization in various subsets. And that's what led to the recommendations for the Pfizer booster. And as we speak, the Moderna booster is being evaluated by the FDA today. Uh, these, there are, are huge data sets that are reviewed and, uh, and it's, it's confusing. I mean, there are uh, some immunity is quite long lasting. So I think we really can't get ahead of ourselves and we have to really wait and see what the data show. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, you know about Pfizer. It's probably pretty likely that Moderna and Janssen may have a similar path, but even that is not yet known. And we will hear more about that next week when after the FDA's review and that goes to CDC and then they will issue their recommendations. Uh, thanks, Marissa. Why don't you stay with us? Uh, there are a whole bunch of questions of people who are trying to find out whether Marissa Montecalvo has changed her mind since <laughs> some of the previous webinars. Uh, let, me, let me summarize a theme here. These are questions where you said in previous webinars, you were against mi mixing and matching vaccines. You said, if you've gotten Pfizer, you're gonna need a booster, get a Pfizer booster. If you got Moderna, wait to see if they approve Moderna. Now there's articles about whether if you got Johnson & Johnson and you need a second shot, maybe you'd be better off getting Moderna or Pfizer rather than the J&J &J, uh, shot. So the questioner wants to know, you still feel that way about not mixing and matching? What are we supposed to do based on what seems to be new evidence all the time? Well, I I don't think the evidence is, is, is really out there yet. I mean, you're waiting for a scientific review of it. There, there's no question that there are studies looking at crossover. You know, is a vector in combination with an MRA, a messenger RNA vaccine in some way beneficial uh, or better than uh, than staying with the same vaccine. Those data are, uh, are in review. I mean, that is part of what's at the FDA as we speak. I don't know if they're going to decide on that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the number of patients 
in these trials, right, to know whether you really have good data behind it. In the interim, I, I kind of stand by what I've said, that I, I really do think that you want to stay within the authorizations that exist. And remember that these two messenger RNA vaccines are not identical. They have different amounts of messenger RNA in them. They have different vehicles for delivery of that uh, um, into your system, into your I immune system. So I, I, I think you you wait for the data and you you stay within the uh, the emergency use authorizations or approvals. Thank you. Um, if you could stay on, and if Dr. Hendricks could come on video and unmute. There's a question here, which I'd like Dr. Hendricks to start with, and then maybe Dr. Montecalvo wants to comment on. I would suspect this may be from a concerned parent. Dr. Hendricks, you said twice, children are not little adults. You said that Pfizer dropped the dose from 30 to 10 micrograms for their vaccine in five to 11 year olds. Do we really know that a five to 11 year old needs two doses of the vaccine since they're already adjusting the dose? How do we know that one might not be enough for a small child? What do we say to that? Maybe Dr. Yeah. Hendricks first, and then if Marissa wants to add anything. Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, and I think a question that a lot of parents have had, I've seen quite a few articles posing that question. Can we just do one dose for children? Um, we know what has been studied and what has been studied has been the two doses. That's what's been in the clinical trials. And so it's really hard to predict if one dose alone will offer an equivalent efficacy over a long time period. Uh, multiple doses for vaccines is very common. If we think of all of the current pediatric vaccines, they're all given in multiple doses. DTaP, IPV, Hib, all of the vaccines that we give, um, people need multiple doses for in order to get their immune system up to the level where it needs to really fight the infection. Um, so I would say right now, until there have been more studies looking at children who just received one dose, we can't say that one dose is going to be enough to really protect kids. Anything to add, Marissa? No, I agree. I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm so struck by how with this pandemic, we have a tendency to question every piece of science that comes out. And I guess it's because of the urgency with which things have to be approved. But, you know, if a, an antibiotic were approved for the treatment of a urinary tract infection, and it were for five days, there, you know, you wouldn't be hearing, well, gee, why can't I just take it for one? Um, right? <laughs> you know, like things get approved based upon study design and what's known about the pharmacology. And, um, and yet with, with this disease, no matter what it is, it seems that, you know, well, what about this path? There, there seems to be an inherent distrust of the scientific data. And um, I, I find that concerning. Uh, and I, of course, agree with everything Dr. Hendricks said. Well, Aunt Marissa, maybe, let me see if I can slightly persuade you. If you study <laughs> compliance of Americans with prescription drugs, most studies say that only about 30% of Americans actually take their prescription drugs as prescribed. Even for the example you gave, you prescribe 10 day of antibiotics for urinary tract infection. A lot of Americans take a couple of doses, they feel better and they stop. They don't actually do what the bottle says. So maybe Americans have been like this all the time. Uh, maybe we're just being more vocal because of social media now. Uh, um, let, me give, yeah, let me give the two of you a break. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Loike and Professor Russo, can you both come on, please? Uh, we've got, it looks to me like a team question for the two of you. Um, and, uh, you know, this is from the song, from the, from the Broadway show, Fiddler on the Roof, posing a question that can make your eyes cross because it's so tough. The questioner wants to know this. 
they used to talk about how some thoracic surgeons didn't want to operate on a patient for lung cancer. The patient didn't ahead of time promise to stop smoking. Now I'm reading about doctors and nurses who say they don't want to treat COVID patients because the patient refused to be vaccinated and quote, they brought the illness on themselves. Can the two of you talk about the ethics of refusing to treat a patient who quote, doesn't do what the doctor or nurse thinks they should have done as a criteria for getting therapy? Let's, let's say, as we would say in the medical physics, a non-trivial question. Uh, perhaps we'll start with, let, let Dr. Russo take a shot at it first and then Professor Loike. Okay, great. Well, um, nurses, just like physicians, physicians take an oath, the Maimonides oath, so do nurses. We take the Nightingale oath to provide care for all of our patients and to do no harm. So this is not ethical for any nurse to say this. It goes against the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics, and it really would not be tolerated in any institution. The um, the staff nurse, whoever said this, would probably be written up for disciplinary action for not caring for a patient. So um, we take this oath and we take this oath seriously to care for all of our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Russo. Professor Loike. I think Dr. Russo said it well. I think there's no room for um, denying your expertise to care for patients and that you have an obligation to care for any patient that comes into you, whether or not he or she adheres to your advice. All right. Well, uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, I can let uh, Professor Loike turn his video off, but we've got another one for Professor Russo while you're with us. Okay. Uh, th this questioner is basically confused about the multiple degrees and alphabet soup after the name of a nurse. RN, LPN, nurse practitioner, nurse clinician, master's degree, doctoral's degree. When you're talking about a potential nursing crisis, it seems like there's a lot of different subsets to the profession. Uh, are we facing a problem across the board or with some of these subsets and how should an interested member of the public interpret that? Okay, our main crisis right now is the staff nurse that's providing clinical care in the hospitals and in home care. And those nurses are bachelor level RNs that are providing direct care. In nursing education, because I had seen a question answered in the question board about the minimum requirements to be a nurse educator, the minimum requirements is a master's degree in nursing. And that's mandated by New York State, where we are, but also nationally by all of our accreditations, uh, American, um, uh, our um, ACN, our accreditation says that that is the minimum requirement, a master's in nursing education. Um, nurse practitioners, there seems to be a major um, influx of them, of nursing, wanting the nurses, the staff nurses want to leave nursing and become nurse practitioners. So we're not seeing in DNPs and nurse practitioners uh, a shortage. The shortage is clinically at the patient's bedside. Um, do you feel, it, should I, is that, uh, thank you. Do you think I need to elaborate on that or? I think you've covered it, thank you. Thank okay. You. Um, next, we've got some more for Dr. Hendricks, please, if she could come on. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, the question is, you've uh, told us a bit about vaccinating adolescents. Could you please comment on two issues? How is one to think about vaccinating an adolescent who might be immunocompromised? And based on what you've just told us about myocarditis, what about an adolescent who might have some history of cardiac problems and being vaccinated? Those are excellent questions. Um, I would say for an adolescent who is immunocompromised, I would, everything we're weighing the risk benefit ratio. So we're weighing what is the risk of the vaccine and what is the risk of getting COVID. For an adolescent who's immunocompromised, the risk of COVID is great. Uh, they could 
develop, they're at higher risk of developing a more severe infection and having worse outcomes. Uh, I would say that that risk outweighs the potential risk from any vaccine side effects. So I would encourage uh, adolescents who are immunocompromised to be vaccinated. An adolescent who has already had uh, a myocarditis or who has had some heart problems, I would encourage them to talk to their cardiologist. Each one of those situations is going to be unique and different, and I think it's going to be difficult to make a broad statement. We do know that there's a risk of getting myocarditis, developing myocarditis from a COVID-19 infection, um, and we know that the pediatric patients who do develop myocarditis from COVID-19, those episodes tend to be significantly worse than what we've seen post-vaccine. Uh, but I would say for unique considerations, that's something that needs to be handled one-on-one uh, -on -one with their physicians. Mm. Thank you. Well, why don't you stay with us for one, one more? Um, this questioner is, is, is wondering, in previous webinars, we've heard a lot about how in adults, the presence of comorbidities increases the risk of death in COVID-19. Is that also true in children? It is. Uh, there have been studies looking at the pediatric deaths due to COVID-19, and we do see a higher rate of death in pediatric patients that do have comorbidities. Uh, there are also some pediatric patients without any comorbidities that do end up having very severe infections or dying from the disease, uh, but there does seem to be a correlation with um, children with comorbidities having worse outcomes with COVID-19. Mm. Thank you. Um, we've got some more for Professor Loike, if he could come on, please. Um, Professor Loike, this is a, a very interesting question. Do you think we face an ethical dilemma as a result of the drug that Dr. Montecalvo just talked about? Is there a risk that people will simply refuse to get vaccinated because now they'll say, I won't get vaccinated. If I get sick, I'll just take that pill from Merck and then I'll be fine. Uh, are we in some way shooting ourselves in the vaccination foot with the development of oral antivirals? It's a very good question. I think that the data right now is incomplete. Yes, there is a positive effect. It reduces um, hospitalization and severe COVID by 50%, whereas vaccinations reduce it by over 90%. I think in the history, in the 100-year history of vaccinations, anywhere from smallpox to polio to measles and mumps, it is clear that overall on a population and on individual level, getting a vaccine is much more effective in controlling a viral or bacterial outbreak. So I think from that perspective, I would favor the vaccines. And also we don't know what the long-term side effects of this drug is. We don't know how effective it is, what, you know, what the risks are, and that's gonna take time. And uh, again, drug uh, side effects usually take a lot longer to determine than vaccines. Again, going back to the history, of vaccines, most, almost 95% of side effects from vaccines are noticeable within the first two or three months. And with drugs, that could be a lot longer. Mm. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, why don't you stay with us? There's, there is a, uh, a question here, which I would say the questioner is either asserting a contradiction in your presentation or uh, wants to challenge you. Uh, Professor Loike just explained that in Jewish medical ethics, uh, the rulings are strongly in favor of vaccination, yet we read in the newspapers about low vaccination rates in Jewish neighborhoods in the New York metropolitan area. Those don't seem to, the two things don't seem to make sense to the questioner, and they'd like to hear from you about that. That's a very concerning situation. Uh, speaking to almost all local and international rabbis, they are all promoted vaccinations. There are, of course, a lot of data or misinformation that comes around, 
And it's very hard when you have misinformation uh, and inaccurate facts to overcome those facts that appear on social media. So the fact that um, you have reports saying that getting a vaccine will cause infertility, which there is no basis for, absolutely no basis. Once it gets out in social media, it's very difficult, even with all of our uh, efforts to overcome that. And I think that's one of the major things that we are facing. And I think it's up to us to better educate these communities and show them that vaccination is the right path to go. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Hoyke. Uh, thank you. Dr. Dr. Montecalvo, if you could come on, please. We've, uh, we've got a religious question for you, uh, Dr. Montecalvo. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Dr. Montecalvo, thank you for your presentations. If a group of people gather at church for morning mass or at the synagogue for morning prayers, and they're all vaccinated, do you think it's getting safe enough to resume serving coffee and a light breakfast in the vestry room to the congregants and to start encouraging again some community fellowship? Or do we still need to continue avoid, to avoid doing that? So a practical, question uh, about the community building. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, what's, what's your you. response? Yeah. <laughs> I think you can do that. I think that's the point of vaccination. We know that vaccination is not going to completely eliminate transmission. We know that. But we also know that it is very protective. Uh, and, you know, I think you do it in a way with some common sense, right? So, you know, you set up tables and you maybe have a certain number of people at tables and keep tables a little bit spread apart so you don't have everyone on top of each other. But um, I think you, I think we want to try to do those things because we need to go back to some of our previous life uh, before COVID and we need to figure out how to do this uh, effectively. Uh, so I, I would encourage people to try to do things like that among vaccinated people. Right. Uh, why don't you s stay with us, uh, Dr. Montecalvo? We've got a whole series of <clears throat> Manuma Pavar uh, questions for you. Let's, let's take a couple of them. Um, do you have any comments regarding reports that other pharmaceutical companies, other than Merck, are getting into this business and are gonna to come to market with Me Too competitors, Phil Manubafar. I don't have any comments. I don't know of, uh, of them per se. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, if you were taking care of a patient that's on, at risk of progressing to severe COVID-19, what would you do now? Use the monoclonal antibodies or use the malnubifar? Right. So I think, um, so again, the, the malnupiravir is not yet authorized for use, but when it is, mm -hmm. uh, assuming that it will be, uh, uh, you know, I think it's going to depend upon uh, the, what kind of risk the person is at for severe disease. Uh, you know, uh, an intravenous medication doesn't have the issues of absorption and some of the limitations that you're going to have with an oral medication. So it really is going to be, uh, we're going to have to think through and develop guidance on that as to who to prioritize for monoclonal antibodies versus oral treatment. Mm. Right, and then someone has written about the issue that Dr. Loike just raised, which is, when are we going to know about side effects of this drug? Oh, I think I think you'll know. It's in the uh, so uh, you know there there uh, is information um, in the review of the interim analysis. It was just not published, and so I wasn't able to present it. But I, I think there will be information. All right. Thank you. Uh, Let's uh, go back to Dr. Hendricks. The questioner, Dr. Hendricks, is raising again the issue of the myocarditis. 
from the vaccine. Do you have an opinion about comparative risks of one brand of the vaccine versus another that a parent should be aware of or might guide them in offering an opinion about what vaccine their child gets? Yeah, we have seen um, those mild cases of myocarditis in younger male um, patients uh, with both the Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccines. Right now, um, we have only seen the 12 and up, um, and the Pfizer is the one that has been proposed for younger kids, 5 to 11. Uh, that's the one that's up for FDA approval now. Um, so when when the time comes that both vaccines are available, um, hopefully we'll be able to look at more studies and see if there is an increased relative risk with one over the other. But as of right now, there, we haven't seen that. We've just seen that it can happen with either one. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a follow-up, Professor Loike, to your uh, comments about vaccine resistance, if you could come on for us, please. Uh, the the uh, viewer writes, isn't the issue of misinformation on social media and non-compliance general not specific? Surely it can't specifically be a problem in the Jewish community, it isn't a problem in all communities during the pandemic. No, thank you, I think it's a very good question. I think that's correct. I think we see the same thing. We've seen the same thing over the last 10 years with the misinformation that vaccination causes autism. Anything that hits social media, irrespective of who the target is, target audience is going to have a very uh, significant impact and uh, influence. So yes, it's not just to the Jewish population. It's all across the board. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Russo, we have a follow-up for you, please. After everything you said about the problems of nursing and nursing burnout, what would the parent of a high school student say if your child says, I think I'd like to go to nursing school? Should I encourage that or talk them out of it after what I've heard from you this afternoon? Oh, please encourage them. Nursing is, I've been a nurse for over 40 years. I can tell you I've never regretted being a nurse. We need young people. We need them to be passionate about caring for people. And if you have an, uh, a high school teen that wants to care about patients, please encourage them. The profession is changing. There will be change within the profession and I would strongly encourage them to become a nurse. Thank you, thank you. Um, it looks like we're gonna have the last series of questions to go back to Dr. Montecalvo, please. Uh, we've got some more people who wanna see if they can talk you out of things that you said at previous webinars. Um, you spoke at a previous webinar and said you didn't think that having antibodies to the spike protein meant you were immune based on the current laboratory studies. Do you still feel that way? So uh, the commercial tests that are available to us are not the same as the tests that are used to determine immunity in, in the studies of these vaccines. Uh, what is used in the studies of the vaccines are neutralization antibodies and uh, neutral and also uh, tests of the memory arm of your immune system, the T cells. And so the presence of anti-spike uh, antibody um, is nice to know, but I don't, that that is not the same as the tests that are actually used to make the decisions about duration of immunity. Okay. I have a technical uh, clinical question for you. Do you think it's safe to vaccinate someone with COVID-19 if they have idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so the predominant issue there is the potential for bleeding. Um, and just like it is for anyone on anticoagulants or anything else, this is an intramuscular injection. And um, 
uh, you just would, I, I think you can administer the vaccine. I think you just want to hold it, you know, a little bit longer uh, to prevent any intramuscular bleeding. I mean, press on the vaccination site, pressure yeah, on the site. Yeah, on the vaccination site. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's have the last word go to you. And if Dr. Hendricks could come on, please. Uh, either this questioner wants to know either in adults or in children, based on what we've heard this afternoon, are we on the pathway for people walking around with a bottle of oral antivirals in their uh, briefcase or in their pocket or in their pocketbook that if they feel they're in a high risk environment, they're gonna start themselves on these drugs like we've talked about today, either in adults or children. So I suppose they'd like the two of you to get out your crystal balls and tell us what the future will be of oral antivirals as a preventative agent for the infection. Uh, Shall, shall we, let's take it in alphabetical order. Dr. Hendricks first and then Dr. Montecalvo. I was hoping Dr. Montecalvo would go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I, that is very difficult to predict. I don't know of, um, of major trials going on right now looking at oral prophylactic medications against COVID-19. I think the, the best preventative measure we have right now are the vaccinations. Um, but I'm very curious to know what Dr. Montecalvo thinks. Yeah, no, I, you know, there is a post-exposure prophylaxis trial going on. And I imagine there's going to be a big demand for this drug. But I want to close on saying that the biggest issue and the biggest demand should be to vaccinate the unvaccinated. Uh, you know, there that is truly our, our biggest issue. And uh, it's easy to get sidelined into all these other things. But until we get primary vaccination into a much greater percentage of people, and hopefully the children very soon as well, and, and that those data are going to be out at the end of the month. Um, you know, that, that's, the, that's the urgency, not everything else. Thank you to Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Montecalvo. Thanks to Professor Russo and Professor Loike and to Professor Etienne. Thanks as always to our experts of information technology, Mr. Cotter, Mr. Frankler, and Dr. Steen, who put on these webinars for us. Thanks to Ashley McCarrick and Amy Jacobs for organizing our programs and to a uh, what may have been a record number of 241 of you who joined us for today's webinar live. Thanks for joining us. We hope you found this a useful and educational program. And I've given up on saying any more. Well, I hope we're done with these webinars. I'm sure we'll be back to see you again, as we always are in about three to four weeks with webinar 16. Until then, thanks for joining us, everyone. Stay safe. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.